Okay. Hi, I'm Susan Leshen, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker and the Senior Director of Patient Programs and Volunteer Services for the Marfan Foundation. I'd like to welcome you to the Marfan Syndrome and Related Conditions Empowerment Series. Tonight's webinar is called The Role of Genetic Counselors in Your Medical Journey. Our presenter for tonight's webinar is Taylor Beecroft. Taylor graduated from Arizona State University in May 2013. She received a bachelor's degree in genetics, cellular, and developmental bio biology. For three years, she worked as a research associate at the Transnational Gen Gen sorry for the <laughs> Genomics Research Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. In August 2016, she entered the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center UT Health Graduate School of Biometric Sciences. That's a very long title. I know, it's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> to pursue a master's degree in genetic counseling. After graduating in May 2018, she became the first genetic counselor for the pediatric cardiology department at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas. Tex Taylor currently works as a board certified genetic counselor for the cardiovascular <laughs> genetics team which specializes in caring for children with connective tissue disorders and other genetic cardiovascular disease. Thank you, Tyler. The webinar will last for about one hour. We will have about a 30 minute presentation followed by 30 minutes of questions. Please type your questions into the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen and we will answer as many as we can. So take it away. Let me just, um, this is Taylor's photo and her bio. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. All right, here we are. So hi, everyone, and, and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, so as Susan mentioned, I work with the cardiovascular genetics team at Texas Children's Hospital, which includes a few doctors that you might be familiar with, um, Dr. Shane Morris, Dr. Lisa D'Alessandro, and Dr. Justin Weigand. And in our cardiovascular genetics clinic, we follow hundreds of patients and families diagnosed with Marfan syndrome, Lois Dietz syndrome, vascular EDS, and other connective tissue conditions. And I'm really honored to be able to speak to this community as part of the Marfan Foundation's webinar series. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, so as you likely know, today I'll be talking about the role that your genetic counselor plays in your medical journey. Next slide. And I thought I would start out with just a basic definition of what genetic counseling is. So the National Society of Genetic Counselors defines genetic counseling as the process of helping people to understand the medical, psychological, and familial implications of the genetic contributions to disease. And even though I think this is a great definition, I always find that definitions can kind of be a bit boring. So rather than running through definitions, genetics terms, and other dry material with you today, I'll instead be illustrating the topics that we're um, covering today with case examples taken directly from my experience working as a genetic counselor. Next slide. So first, to give you a little background on how genetic counselors fit into the medical team. So we're, we're healthcare professionals with a specialized education in both genetics and counseling. We typically all have a two-year master's degree from an accredited genetic counseling training program, and we're board certified by the American Board of Genetic Counseling. And we always work alongside doctors and nurses as members of the medical team. Next slide. So before we get into our case examples, I first wanted to outline the general roles that most genetic counselors tend to play. Many genetic counselors work in a clinical setting and their specific roles tend to vary based on which specialty they work in. So different specialties which you may come across a genetic counselor um, if you have a connective tissue disorder include specialties such as general genetics, cardiology, and possibly preconception and prenatal genetic counseling as well. But regardless of specialty, all genetic counselors are experts who are responsible for the roles that you see outlined here. So an we analyze family and medical histories in order to assess the chance of a genetic condition as well as the chance for a disease to occur or reoccur. And then we use our assessment of the family medical history in order to determine what genetic test is mo most appropriate for a given patient. So while doing so, we're also able to provide personalized information in order to educate our patients and their families about various aspects of their medical care. So one important thing to keep in mind is that we have been specially trained to explain complex medical and genetic information to patients in a way that is very easy for them to understand. So we can explain things such as how inherited conditions may affect the patient and their family, 
provide key information about genetic testing, and also give you the appropriate medical management guidelines for your condition. For example, if you have Marfan syndrome, we can talk with you about how often you should have an echocardiogram or an eye exam. Very importantly, rather than being a provider that tells you what to do, we give you all the information you might need to work with you as a teammate um, in order to help you decide what decisions are best for your healthcare needs. So if genetic testing ends up um, becoming the right avenue for you to pursue, we're there to help interpret and disclose your genetic testing results. And we'll get to the importance of interpretation a little later in this talk. Um, but finally, genetic counselors are also specially trained uh, to support patients' emotional needs and their psychosocial concerns. So we really aim to provide counseling that promotes healthy coping and adaptation to the risks associ associated with one's medical condition. So we usually have an arsenal of resources um, available for patient support, including support groups, online forums, introducing you to advocacy organizations like the Marfan Foundation, as well as other practical things such as early childhood intervention services for any children with developmental concerns. Next slide. Oh, there we go. So now we'll work our way down that list of genetic counseling roles by running through some specific case examples that help illustrate exactly how genetic counselors help their patients and families. So for the next slide, um, before we dive into those case examples, I first wanted to introduce you to what I think of as the genetic counselor's best friend. And that best friend is the family tree. So if you've ever seen a genetic counselor before, you were likely interviewed in, in very, um, good detail about several generations of your family history. It probably felt like an unexpected pop quiz on your family. And your genetic counselor likely drew out a family tree, just like the ones I'm gonna show you. So to orient you to these family trees, it's important first to know that square symbols indicate male relatives and circle symbols indicate female relatives. So looking at our slide here, we have Michael and he has an arrow pointing to him because he's our patient today. If we go to the next slide, um, now we've added in Michael's parents, brother, and sister. So again, you notice that males are square, females are circle, and the parents are joined together by a relationship line that um, indicate that together they had the children that are drawn below them. So again, if we go to the next slide, uh, it's a very similar process for drawing out the aunts, uncles, and grandparents, and now we've ended up with a three-generation family tree. And what we typically do during a genetic counseling appointment is notate everyone's ages, any relevant medical diagnoses under their symbol on the tree. And this is um, the tool that helps your genetic counselor identify any patterns that could indicate a genetic disease running through the family. And it also helps them keep track of and identify any relatives who might be at risk for a genetic diagnosis if we find a mutation running through the family. All right, now onto our real case example. So um, the patient we have for case one is a five-year-old male who was referred to our clinic by his pediatrician. His doctor noticed that his height was uh, over the 99th percentile for his age group. So he was very tall, much taller than other children his age. And he also had a significant pectus excavatum. So for anyone who might not be familiar with that term, this is actually just an indentation in the breastbone that can, ca can cause a concave appearance of the chest. And we frequently see it in connective tissue disorders. So these two features together um, kind of started to prompt the pediatrician's concern for possible Marfan syndrome. So he referred his patient to have an echo and an appointment with us at Cardiovascular Genetics Clinic. Next, next slide. Um, so his echocardiogram, which is just an ultrasound of the heart, was completely normal, meaning his aortic dimensions were appropriately, appropriately sized for his age, and there weren't any signs of mitral valve prolapse. Again, for those who might not know, um, enlargement or dilation of the aorta and prolapsing of the mitral valve in the heart are two signs that we frequently look for in our clinic um, as they're commonly uh, seen heart findings in connective tissue disorders. So with a completely normal echocardiogram and two nonspecific physical features, I next needed to take a look at the rest of the family tree to start to search for more clues. And when I asked about the mother's side of the family, her history was completely negative for any concerning findings or diagnoses. But when I got to the father's side of the history, my, father, my, my suspicions um, started to peak for a possible connective tissue disorder. Now, why is that? So just like our patient, the father has tall stature and a pectus excavatum, but he also has very long fingers. He's very nearsighted or has myopia. And he reports that his lungs spontaneously collapsed when he was a teenager. 
And when you start to think about all these findings happening in one person, this really begins to paint the picture of a connective tissue disorder. But still, there's more information we need to get about the rest of the family. So the dad reports that he has two siblings and that his sister looks just like him. So she's very tall. She also has very long fingers, but she's never had an echocardiogram. And his father, or our five-year-old patient's grandfather, had also passed away unexpectedly at the age of 55 from what the family believes and was told was a heart attack, but an autopsy was never performed to really concern or to confirm this exact diagnosis. So the family also reports that the grandfather looks just like the patient's father and his aunt. Next slide. All right, so now that I finished out drawing out the family tree for this family, what do I usually do next? The very first thing I usually do is review the family history with the family in order to kind of discuss and go over the red flags that I'm seeing that make me think there could be an undiagnosed connective tissue disorder. So the red flags for this family include the constellation of signs and features in the patient's father and aunt, as well as the sudden heart-related death in his grandfather. Next slide. So from here, I would recommend that genetic testing is uh, appropriate for this family, given the findings that we see in the family tree. And rather than testing the five-year-old patient, I would actually recommend that his father have the testing first, as he has more specific features suggestive of a connective tissue disorder, which would make him a lot more likely to test positive than his son, who has very few features. Um, and because of many of the signs and symptoms of various connective tissue disorders tend to overlap, I would recommend that we order a full panel of genes to be tested so we can simultaneously test for all of the currently known and well understood causes of connective tissue disorders. So panels like this typically have 20 to 25 genes that includes conditions such as Marfan's, Lois Dietz syndrome, vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, as well as classical Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, among others. Next slide. And another really important part of this process is explaining exactly what this testing panel does, which takes us back to a quick high school biology lesson in genetics. So if you first think of your DNA as a massive recipe book for making a human being, inside that recipe book are over 20,000 different genes, and you inherited one copy of each of those genes from your mother, and one copy of each of those genes from your father. So you end up with two copies of each of these genes. Now, all of these genes are in charge of performing a very specific and a very important job in your body. And so some of those genes have the recipe for your eye color or your hair color, other genes determine your height. And there are other very important genes that help create and maintain the connective tissue in your body. And the connective tissue is in charge of supporting things like your bones, your tendons, your ligaments, your heart valves, your blood vessels, and it holds the body's cells together. So when we have a spelling change or a mutation in the recipe for a connective tissue gene, you end up with one of the connective tissue disorders such as Marfan or Lois D syndrome. So these connective tissue related genes make up the 25 gene panel that we often offer to our patients in our clinic when we think they have a connective tissue disorder. So again, we're taking these 25 genes and we're looking for a spelling change or, or mutation in one of them. Next slide. So once we've explained what genetic testing is, who should have the test done. The next important step in the discussion is to explain the benefits and limitations to that testing. And this is essentially just a conversation about the pros and cons of the specific genetic test that was recommended. So an example of some pros would include that the genetic testing allows for more tailored medical care. It can give your doctors information about any increased risks that you may have, um, such as the risk, increased risk for an aortic tear or dissection. And it also allows us to test other relatives in the family who might be at risk for having the same genetic condition. As an example of a con, which we'll actually talk about a little bit later in the talk, we have the potential to receive uncertain results from the test, which could be difficult for us to interpret. So once the patient is given all this information, has a chance to think it through, the most important part of this process is allowing them to decide whether they wanna move forward with testing. From my experience in our clinic, the majority of the time our, our patients and their parents decide to go ahead with testing. Um, I find that people tend to wanna to know as much information as possible, especially when it comes to conditions that have a, a, a chance of affecting the heart. Next slide. So now we're back with our family tree. And as you see here um, with the change in shading in the father, we've done genetic testing and he's tested positive for a mutation in the FBN1 or the fibrillin gene. And this gives him a genetically confirmed diagnosis of Marfan syndrome. 
Um, because of his positive genetic testing, uh, the father also was recommended to meet with a cardiologist for an echocardiogram, and he was found to have mitral valve prolapse. So you can see with him, the Marfan syndrome is indicated by the red shading, and the mitral valve prolapse is indicated by the green shading. Next slide. So once a patient learns that they carry a genetic dis uh, diagnosis like Marfan syndrome, it becomes super important to review the medical management recommendations with them. So for this father, we already recommended that he sees a cardiologist and have an echo, but we also recommend that he have his eyes evaluated by an ophthalmologist for issues like lens dislocation, which is very common in Marfan syndrome. And then in patients who are found to have aortic enlargement, which this which his dad didn't have, um, we would also uh, discuss specific limitations and restrictions to physical activity, which includes avoiding things like uh, competitive contact sports, as well as isometric exercises such as heavy weight lifting and things such as push-up or pull-ups. Um, these exercises tend to quickly increase the blood pressure, which can cause stress on the walls of the aorta, so we tend to steer our patients away from them. Next slide. So now that we know that there's a genetic diagnosis, it's also very important to, to review the inheritance of that diagnosis. So in the case of Marfan syndrome, and honestly, most other connective tissue disorders as well, um, the, inheritance pa it, the inheritance pattern is uh, what we call dominant, meaning that if you have a mutation in just one of your two copies of the fibrillin gene, you have Marfan syndrome. So this means that each of this man's first degree relatives, um, such as his children, his siblings, all of them have a 50% chance of also having Marfan syndrome. So when you think of the inheritance for his children, he had a 50% chance to pass on his copy of the fibrillin gene that um, causes Marfan syndrome and a 50% chance to pass on the other fibrillin gene that does not cause Marfan syndrome. So as you can imagine, this has really important implications for the rest of the family, which if we go to the next slide, we talk about when we discuss cascade testing or follow-up testing for his relatives. So in this case, we recommended that both of his children, um, as well as his brother and sister, have genetic testing for the known mutation that we found in the fibrillin gene. Next slide. So when we ended up doing this testing, we found that our five-year-old patient, who's now colored in red, and his paternal aunt also carry the same mutation. So they were also both diagnosed with Marfan syndrome. And when the aunt was evaluated by her cardiologist, she was also found to have mitral valve prolapse, as well as um, enlargement, again, of the aortic root. Um, so she shaded in red for Marfan, green for mitral valve prolapse, and gray for root dilation. So we kind of use these colors and shading techniques to track um, the different symptoms that are running through the family. So considering that she's had really no other medical issues um, in her to this point in her life, she might not have ever even known of her enlarged aortic root and increased risk for a tear in that aorta if her brother hadn't had this genetic testing to begin with. So now because she's had this cascade testing, she's able to follow closely with her cardiologist and hopefully reduce her risk for an aortic event in the future. Also, now that she's tested positive, we can again recommend more cascade testing for her two children. Um, so going to the next slide. Um, both children were tested, and her three-year-old son was also diagnosed with Marfan syndrome, and he was found to also have aortic root dilation. So one thing that's really important about diagnosing Marfan syndrome at such a young age is that a cardiologist can begin to follow the child right away and start them on treatment with medications such as beta blockers or ARBs. Um, and these meds really help reduce the growth of the aorta over the lifespan, which is one of our main goals for the cardiologists that work in our genetics clinic. Because um, if we can help a child grow into their aortic dimensions, we can hopefully reduce the chance that they will ever need to go to the operating room for an aortic repair or replacement in their adult years. And the last thing I wanted to note is that we also did genetic testing for the paternal grandmother to rule out that she had Marfan syndrome. And as we expected, she, she actually tested negative. So although we couldn't test the grandfather who had already passed away, we can infer that he had Marfan syndrome given his medical history and the fact that two of his children also have Marfan syndrome. Next slide. Perfect. So now we'll move on to um, our next most common role for genetic counselors. We've already covered this a little bit in the previous case example, but I wanna discuss some other important cases that illustrate the importance of selecting the most appropriate test for a patient. Next slide. So in this example, we'll be comparing two children who are referred to us for the exact same reason, 
They both have aortic root dilation, again, that enlargement near the beginning of the aorta, and pectus excavatum, or that indentation in the chest wall. Next slide. For this case, we have a 10-year-old boy who, in addition to his aortic dilation and his pectus, is also extremely tall for his age and has very long fingers and toes. He's also very nearsighted and needs to wear glasses for that. So similar to the very first case we talked about, all of these features together start to paint a picture of a connective tissue disorder. But before we dive into the recommended genetic testing for him, let's look at our other patient. So this is an eight-year-old little girl who has aortic root dilation, but her pectus actually has a different appearance than the boy we just talked about. So in this patient, she has a chest wall that points outwards at the top and then starts to point inwards at the bottom, which gives her sternum a very unique S-shaped appearance. This little girl is also very short for her age, so her height falls below the 10th percentile, meaning she's a lot shorter than other children of the same age. And during her physical exam, we also noted that she had a webbed neck or extra skin at the base of her neck, and she also has eyes that are very widely spaced and slant downwards. And when we see all of these features together, this really makes us think that the patient is likely to have a genetic condition, but rather than a connective tissue disorder, we actually think she has something else altogether. Next slide. Despite these patients coming in for the same original region, reason, so the aortic root dilation and that pectus, um, they will actually have two different genetic tests ordered. So the little girl fits a very classic uh, picture of a condition you might not have heard before called Noonan syndrome. And this is a genetic disorder that is caused by a completely different set of genes that aren't found on the connective tissue disorder panel at all. So because of this, we recommended that she have a Noonan syndrome panel test, which includes all of the genes known to cause that condition. And for the little boy, we recommended a connective tissue disorder panel because his features were more consistent with that diagnosis. Next slide. Oh, sorry, animations. <laughs> Press through a couple times to the next one. There we go. So when their genetic testing results came back, the little girl had a mutation in the PTPN11 gene, which causes Noonan syndrome. And the little boy had a mutation in his fibrillin gene, giving him a diagnosis of Marfan syndrome. So what we've learned from this case is even though they were referred for very similar reasons, had we not ordered the appropriate panel for either one of these patients, we could have missed their true diagnosis. Next slide. All right. For our next case, we have a five-year-old little boy with aortic root dilation again and mitral valve prolapse. So he also has very loose joints, which make him very flexible. And on physical exam, we noticed that he had large cupped ears, uh, a long face, and a very prominent forehead. We also learned from his parents that he has significant motor and speech delays and is having a lot of difficulty in school. So while these first few symptoms of root dilation, mitral valve prolapse, and joint laxity make us think of connective tissue disorders, his physical features are, and developmental concerns are actually not typically seen in these conditions, which cause us to wonder whether another genetic condition might be at play here. So when I see this list of features, it actually perks my suspicion for another completely different genetic condition called fragile X syndrome. And this is a condition that can cause all of the features that this little boy has which is why rather than a connective tissue disorder panel, as a genetic counselor, I would order fragile X testing for this child. Um, another important test that is standardly recommended for all children who have developmental delays is called a chromosome microarray. And this is a comprehensive test that checks whether any of the patient's chromosomes have missing or extra pieces that be, could be causing their developmental issues. So next slide. In this child's case, his chromosome microarray was normal and his testing for fragile X syndrome was positive, which means that his features were all caused by this, this condition rather than a possible connective tissue disorder. So again, this is another really good example that genetic testing isn't one size fits all. So the next very crucial role for many genetic counselors is the interpretation and disclosure of genetic testing results. And before we dive into that, this, I just wanted to talk about the three different possible results that we typically get back from the genetic testing that we order. So the first positive result is a mutation or a spelling error that has been identified in one of the genes. You'll also hear this called um, uh, the term pathogenic variant, and that's um, synonymous with saying mutation. The other possible result is a negative result, meaning that all of the genes were normal, so they were all spelled correctly. And the third possible result is called a variant of uncertain significance, which we frequently call VUS for short. 
And this result means that the patient has had a unique spelling change found in their gene, but the testing laboratory doesn't currently have enough scientific evidence or information about that variant to determine whether it should be classified as positive or negative. Put another way, we don't really know if the, var or if the variant is the mutation that causes the disease or whether it's actually a benign spelling change in the gene. So everyone has variants in their genes. It's exactly what makes each of us unique. The important part is trying to distinguish whether or not a certain variant is causing disease. So for our next case, we have a 15-year-old girl who has been followed by a cardiologist since birth after she was found to have a heart murmur. Uh, the heart murmur was found to be caused by a small hole in her heart that needed to be monitored over time. And after an echocardiogram that she had at age 12, she was found to have newly developed mitral valve prolapse with mild leaking um, of the blood going in the reverse direction at that valve. So genetic testing was actually recommended by her car cardiologist at this point in time, but it was never completed. Um, and by age 14, her next echocardiogram showed that that mitral valve prolapse was worsening and the leakage was worsening as well. And she also had newly developed aortic root dilation that was in the moderate range, which if you think about is a very significant change from two years prior. So at that point, she was referred to our clinic and we evaluated her when she was 15 years old. And on, on our physical exam, we noticed that she had tall stature, pectus excavatum, she had very flat feet, stretch marks in myopia or nearsightedness. And taking all of her features together, she had a Marfan syndrome systemic score of five. So for those of you who might not know, the systemic score is a point system designed to help providers clinically diagnose Marfan syndrome based on a patient's clinical features. Um, and having a systemic score of seven allows a patient to be diagnosed with Marfan syndrome even without genetic testing to confirm. In fact, this is frequently how Marfan syndrome was diagnosed before genetic testing really became widely available and more affordable. So this patient's systemic score was quite high and given her rapidly increasing size of her aorta, we recommended that she have genetic testing, again, with that connective tissue disorder panel. And another important thing to note here is that she had no family history of Marfan syndrome, but we'll get back to that in just a second. So looking at her results on the next slide, this patient was found to have a variant of uncertain significance in the fibrillin gene, again, the gene for Marfan syndrome. Um, and whenever I get an uncertain result like this back from one of my patients, I do a bit more investigating to decide if I think that the variant matches the patient's symptoms and could be at fault, or whether I think it's a red herring and is more likely to be benign. So in this case, the fibrillin gene perfectly fits with the patient's clinical features. All of her symptoms fit with Marfan syndrome. And when I read information about the actual variant, I find that it has never been identified in anyone else, healthy or otherwise, who has ever had genetic testing that included their fibrillin gene. And looking at the, spe the specific spelling change of this variant, I note that it could be impacting how well the gene works, but the spelling change is located in an area of the gene that is generally supposed to be the same in all people. So this makes me wonder whether the variant truly is damaging. <clears throat> So in order to get um, more information about how this variant is affecting our patient, I thought that it would be really important to test both of her parents, um, neither of whom have features of Marfan syndrome. So if you're thinking, well, why would we test an unaffected parent? Um, you know, how would that be helpful in this case? Well, if one of the parents carries this variant and doesn't have any features associated with Marfan syndrome, that actually be very strong evidence that the variant is not causing Marfan syndrome in our patient. Um, on the flip side, if the variant was not inherited from either parent and it is a brand new change in our patient's DNA, this is further evidence that the variant could be to blame for the patient's clinical features. So with that information, both parents eagerly agreed to be tested for the variant. And on the next slide, we have another set of results. Here they are. Um, and these results showed that both parents were negative, meaning that neither of them had a change in the fibrillin gene. Um, so fortunately, this new information gave the laboratory enough data to actually reclassify this variant as a positive, likely pathogenic result. So likely pathogenic here is another way of saying that the spelling change found in the gene is likely to be a mutation that causes Marfan syndrome. So if this variant were ever to be found in another person with Marfan syndrome, it could actually be reclassified even further to pathogenic, meaning it is definitely a mutation that causes Marfan syndrome. But for now, it's, they're just calling it likely pathogenic or likely a mutation. And I, I really like this case because it illustrates the importance of really taking a closer look at every single uncertain result that a genetic counselor gets 
rather than just taking that result at face value and doing no further investigation. So our next case, we have a 16 year old boy who is very tall and very slim. He has notably long fingers and toes, and he also has a very mild curvature or scoliosis in his spine. And he was referred to our clinic because of two findings in his heart. So this patient has a bicuspid aortic valve and a dilated ascending aorta. And on the next slide, I have an example to just show you. Um, so the aortic valve is usually what we call tricuspid, meaning it has three leaflets that make the valve look a lot like a Mercedes-Benz logo, which is then opening and closing, opening and closing to let the blood through. A bicuspid aortic valve has one of those three leaflets fused together, which you can kind of see um, in the picture on the left, um, the fused line in the illustration of the closed aortic valve on that image. A bicuspid aortic valve can be seen in conjunction with enlargement of the ascending aorta, which you can kind of point out here on the image to the right. Um, while in many connective tissue disorders, dilation is more common at the beginning of the aorta, or what we call the aortic root, it's also possible for dilation to occur a little later in the aorta, so in the ascending part as well. Uh, so given this cons constellation of possible genetic or connective tissue disorder features in our patient, we decided to order genetic testing. And on our next slide, you will see that his results showed another variant of uncertain significance, this time in the COL3A1 or collagen 3 gene. So you may or may not know that this gene is associated with um, a condition called vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is often called vascular EDS for short. Um, and this condition is associated with extremely fragile blood vessels, translucent skin where the veins are highly visible, very easy bruising, and often significant hyperflexibility. Interesting though, um, aortic dilation isn't frequently seen in vascular EDS. So now it becomes important to evaluate the likelihood that this variant is associated with our current patient's symptoms. So um, on the next slide, when I analyze this variant um, itself, I note that it could affect how well the gene works, but this exact same variant has also been reported and seen in several healthy people, and it's never been reported in a person who actually has vascular EDS. Additionally, our patient um, has no signs of vascular EDS. Being tall and thin, having long fingers, having bicuspid aortic valve with ascending aorta dilation, none of these are really known to be associated with vascular EDS. Uh, additionally, he also doesn't report any history of vascular rupture, easy bruising, excessive flexibility, um, things that would start to pique our concern that he might have it. He doesn't have. So given all this information, I feel like the variant is very unlikely to be a true mutation for our patient. However, as he continues to follow up with us in clinic, I'll continue to monitor the status of his variant to see if it ever gets reclassified by the laboratory as positive or negative. Um, and also keep an eye on whether he develops any concerning signs of vascular EDS. Next slide. So um, what do we tell our patient when disclosing this test result? First off, I would explain all the evidence behind why I think the variant is likely unlikely to be a mutation. And then I would explain that bicuspid aortic valve is fairly common in the general population. So we know that about one to two out of every hundred people actually has a bicuspid aortic valve. And we also know that dilation in the ascending aorta is often associated with that finding. So it's not entirely surprising that these two things were identified together in him. And while we have fortunately ruled out common connective tissue conditions that cause a high risk of dissection with enlarged aortas, uh, this genetic testing panel of only 25 genes does not completely rule out the possibility of a genetic disorder. So for example, the patient still could have a mutation in a gene that has yet to be discovered and added to our panel. So given these uninformative genetic testing results, we would just follow up with this patient based on his clinical features. So we would recommend another visit with an echocardiogram in about a year. In this way, we can evaluate whether his aortic dilation is stable or progressive and then treat him accordingly. Next slide. So our last set of case examples here will cover how genetic counselors support their patients' emotional needs and psychosocial concerns. Um, our next case, involves a 17 year old girl who was clinically diagnosed with Marfan syndrome early on in her childhood. And she received this diagnosis without any genetic testing because she had a high Marfan syndrome systemic score. And she also has a father with a genetically confirmed diagnosis of Marfan syndrome. One thing to note is that our patient never had any genetic testing, at least not to date. 
So while I'm collecting information about this family's history, the patient's medical history, her mother made a comment that really caught my attention. She had mentioned that she really, really did not want her daughter to have any children. And I looked over at her daughter. She didn't have much reaction to the statement, but I still felt it would really be important to figure out why her mother felt this way. So I asked her to share more information about, you know, why she had that sentiment. And I came to find out that the patient's mother and father both felt pretty guilty that Marfan syndrome and its associated health risks were passed on to their daughter, and they really didn't want that to happen again in their grandchildren. And many parents who have passed a genetic condition onto their child feel guilty for doing so, even though it was something that was completely beyond their control. Um, so after really validating that their emotions were completely normal, I thought it was also appropriate to segue into talking to them about different reproductive options. Next slide. So um, now our patient had not yet had any genetic testing and her father's results from long ago had been lost because he'd had them several decades prior, I believe. And if we were able to obtain a positive genetic testing result for this patient now, this would open the door for a few different reproduction op options for her when she's ready to plan her own family. So one of these options is called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or PGD for short. Um, and this option is best for parents who wish to prevent passing their known genetic condition onto their children. So to kind of explain this process very simply, several of the mother's eggs are fertilized by the father's sperm in a laboratory. And then the resulting embryos are tested to, and evaluated um, to see if they carry um, the mutation. So for conditions like Marfan syndrome, we find that about 50% of the embryos will have the mutation and 50% will not. And once the embryos are tested, only the embryos without the mutation will be implanted into the mother. Again, this type of testing can only be done when one of the parents has a genetically confirmed mutation. So having that genetic test for our patient was important if she would like to plan her family in this way in the future. On the next slide, um, so we have for parents who don't feel that pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is right for them, it's also possible to do prenatal testing while the mother is pregnant or have the baby tested immediately after birth so that we can confirm or rule out a genetic diagnosis right away. These are really great options for parents who might worry less about passing a genetic condition onto their children, as long as they can at least be made aware of the diagnosis as early as possible in order to prepare for that. After reviewing this information with my patient and her mom, they were both really happy to hear that there were different options that would allow her to plan a family in a way that was really best suited to her and her needs. So she opted to have genetic testing that day and we were able to confirm her diagnosis of Marfan syndrome and identify her exact fibrillin mutation, which she can then use later on to plan her family in the future. Next slide. All right, so our last case of the day involves an eight-year-old boy who was very recently diagnosed with Marfan syndrome. He and his family are from a very small rural town in Texas, and during our appointment, his mom was telling me that she was very concerned that no one in their town has Marfan syndrome, and on top of that, no one really even knows what it is, including the patient's pediatrician. So she was really worried about his future medical care, especially if his primary doctor didn't know about Marfan syndrome, and she's especially worried that the hospital staff were not very, or very familiar with Marfan syndrome either. So she was, con oh, and on top of that, she was also concerned that there really weren't any children with a similar condition in their town that her son could really meet and, and relate with. Next slide. So these were completely valid concerns that I was more than happy to help this mom address. And really for any family with these kinds of healthcare related concerns, a genetic counselor is um, able to help in, in many ways. So for example, we can provide a letter or other written materials to help explain the diagnosis and its associated health risks in a way that will help their providers better care for their child. And I've had parents provide this information to their pediatrician. And in towns that are small enough, uh, they can even give this information to hospital staff and also all of the local paramedics before an emergency ever happens so that all of these providers are aware of their child and their specific diagnosis ahead of time. Um, I'm also happy to speak with care providers directly by phone or email um, in order to talk with them about the diagnosis. So that's something I'm always more than happy to do for my families. And another important aspect of preparedness that we feel is crucial to help families is actually rehearsing a plan for future emergencies. So in our clinic, um, we help coach the families on exactly what to do, exactly what to say, if the child is experiencing severe chest pain that could be concerning for an aortic tear or dissection. 
And we also help the child themselves rehearse. We do like a little role play. We help them rehearse exactly what to say if they happen to end up in a, an emergency room without a parent, say they've gone to the emergency room while they're at school. Um, so we want them to know how to tell their doctors that they have Marfan syndrome, that they are at risk for an aortic dissection, especially if they have severe chest pain. On the next slide, um, for all of our patients diagnosed with Marfan, Lois Dietz, and other related connective tissue disorder, we love to provide them with this super awesome emergency card from emergency alert card from the Marfan Foundation. It's a super helpful tool for families to carry with them, um, and it allows them to quickly give information to their providers, even in very stressful moments. And the information on the card is accurate and straight to the point and perfect for giving to an ER doctor who might not really have any idea what Marfan syndrome is. Um, there's also a very similar card that we have here um, that we give our patients with vascular EDS that was produced by the genetics team at the University of Washington. Again, this is just another great tool for com quickly conveying life-saving information to your care providers in an emergency situation and something we like to give all of our patients with vascular EDS. All right, so on this slide, um, we, we know that genetic counselors are always prepared to help you address any social, emotional, or coping concerns you might have. Um, we can often help you find reputable in-person and online support groups. Uh, we can personally connect you with some of our other patient families who are affected by the same diagnosis. So for example, we have an amazing mother of two boys who have vascular EDS that is a very active advocate for the vascular EDS community. So we introduce a lot of our newly diagnosed families to her, and she acts as a really great ambassador and source of support for our families who are learning to cope with a diagnosis that can often feel really overwhelming when it's first received. Genetic counselors also love to introduce their patients to advocacy organizations like the Marfan Foundation, um, who often offer incredible communities of support, annual conferences, education, anything that you could imagine a person with Marfan syndrome needs. The Marfan syndrome does such a great job of addressing those needs. Speaking of which, um, thanks to Susan, I recently learned that the Marfan Foundation offers a wonderful mentor program for anyone with Marfan syndrome or anyone who has a relative with Marfan syndrome who's looking for a mentor with experiences that are similar to them. So you can either sign up to have a mentor or to be a mentor, whatever you'd like. And it could be a long-term mentor or um, someone that you can talk with pr to prepare um, for your first surgery, for your heart, your dislocated lenses, for your scoliosis you'll be paired up with someone who has been through the exact same process before, who can be a great source of support for you as you start to sail these uncharted seas in your medical journey. So I wanted to plug that awesome program because I thought it was very cool. Thank you. <laughs> so as we've been talking about all of this, if you found yourself wondering, you know, doctors can do genetic testing, why should I even work with a genetic counselor? These are the important things you might want to keep in mind. First off, the field of genetics is exploding and literally evolving on a daily basis. And in order to ma maintain our board certification as genetic counselors, we're required to always stay informed about the latest research and provide up-to-date medical information to our patients. So we also can play an important role in reducing healthcare costs to you and your insurance company by selecting appropriate targeted testing and we're able to identify labs that will provide the highest quality test for the best cost. On top of that, we're, um, e we're equipped to accurately interpret complicated genetic testing results. So kind of as you might have seen in our case examples, results are often not cut and dry. Um, variants of uncertain significance are frequently detected from our genetic testing and they can be challenging to interpret. So genetic counselors are trained to evaluate these variants of uncertain significance with a very close eye and then relay that information to the patient in an understandable way. Um, actually, in that same vein, um, we're experienced in uh, conveying complex information to patients of all ages, all education levels in a way that's easy for them to understand. Um, you know, it, it's possible for providers um, who understand the results of a genetic test to struggle with communicating that information to patients without causing misunderstandings or confusion, which is why working with a genetic counselor can be so helpful. They're just kind of like an in-between translator and interpreter that can help make things easier to understand. 
Uh, genetic counselors are also great to have on your care team because they're able to personally guide you through every step of the diagnostic process. So from your original referral to a genetics provider, to prevent writing your testing results, to guiding you through your current and future medical management after receiving a genetic diagnosis, your genetic counselor is there with you every step of the way. Given that we also have training in counseling techniques, we're also well-versed in breaking difficult news delicately and providing emotional support when it's needed. Slide. Okay, so if you have yet to see a genetic counselor and you're wondering how you could best prepare to see one, um, here are my best pieces of advice. Um, first, come in with information about your family history. So that includes things like their current ages, ages they may have passed away, their relevant medical diagnoses, anything you think might be pertinent to the family tree. Um, also, no details about your personal medical history, and you can help yourself do this by bringing your outside medical records, maybe your echocardiogram reports. Um, but if you're being seen because there's a known genetic diagnosis in the family, it's especially important to bring a copy of your genetic testing results so your genetic counselor knows exactly which test to order for you. Testing for a known mutation is a lot more cost effective than testing for a whole panel of genes, and it virtually eliminates the, the risk of getting uncertain results. So it's really important if someone in your family has positive genetic testing to ask them for a copy to bring with you to your appointment. Um, last thing is um, many patients have a lot of questions, so don't hesitate to write them down and bring them with you so you don't forget. I've had patients whip out a notebook full of questions and we've walked through every single one of them and made sure they were all answered before the patient's appointment was over. So don't hesitate to do so yourself. Um, if you're wondering what kinds of questions are fair game for your genetic counselor, um, here are some questions that I frequently hear from my patients. Um, you know, some will come and ask, how do I tell my family about this? We don't talk about our medical problems. Um, you know, that's not something we really discuss. So I can help these individuals rehearse how to break the news to their family. Or alternatively, I can also provide um, what we call a family letter, which they can give to their families with all the information they would need to know about the diagnosis, the mutation, how to find a genetic counselor, so they can kind of have that all in one piece of paper to give to their relatives. I also frequently have people ask me for advice on how to get testing for their relatives, how to get their genetic or their relatives in to see a genetic counselor. Um, you know, other good examples of questions, what should my child's pediatrician know? What do I tell my child's school? Um, I've also had families ask if I know any patient families that they can talk with so that they have somebody to relate to and ask advice from. Um, and I also uh, have patients, that I get this on almost every single appointment, patients asking how will genetic results affect my health and life insurance. So these are all fair game questions um, that you could ask your genetic counselor as well. All right, so if you're wondering what else your genetic counselor is able to help you with, my most important piece of advice is to just ask. <clears throat> Next slide. I, I once had a patient's mother ask me if I could help uh, help her find a way to permanently store DNA from her husband who had recently passed away. And being a very new genetic counselor at the time, I really hadn't done this before, but I knew that I had the skills and knowledge to help her out, especially at a time when she was still adjusting to life without her husband and when she had plenty of other things to worry about. So I was able to find a reputable DNA banking laboratory to, to store her husband's DNA and I was able to help coordinate all the paperwork, the logistics, which including uh, speaking with representatives from the laboratory and the medical examiner's office. And I also helped with the shipment of the husband's blood sample from the medical examiner's office in Texas to the laboratory in California. So even if you're not sure if your genetic counselor is the right person to ask your question to, I say just ask anyways. You know, if they aren't the ones with the answer, um, we often know how to find the person or the resource that has the answer that you're looking for. So uh, if you're wondering how to find a genetic counselor near you, um, a very helpful tool for finding one is actually this website through the National Society of Genetic Counselors. It's called the Find a Genetic Counselor Tool. And it's a very helpful tool. Um, if you go, if you click to the next slide, when you go to this link, you get to this page. And if you type in your zip code and the, select the genetic counseling specialty, specialty that you're interested in, so cardiology, prenatal, um, then you can hit search and then it'll bring up a list of genetic counselors in your area and it usually offers their email or their office phone number so that you're able to get in touch with them. 
All right, so I'm very excited to be working closely with the Marfan Foundation to help plan their 2019 annual conference that will be held here in Houston this year. And I'm really looking forward to seeing any of you who plan to come. So if you see me, please come say hi. I would absolutely love to meet you. And on our last slide, I just wanted to thank the Marfan Foundation for giving me a platform to talk uh, to one of my very favorite communities about the importance of genetic counselors. And also thank you to the illustrator, illustrators at FreePick for all of my quirky cartoon characters. And thank you to Texas Children's Hospital for making it possible for me to do exactly what I love and work with such incredible patients. And last but not least, thank you for all of you for joining me for this webinar today. And I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Okay, and thank you, Taylor, because for your fantastic presentation. Of course. It was so thorough. It was wonderful. All right, so we're going to move on to your questions. And I see we have two questions. Um, I'll read the first one. Um, my daughter, age 37, was clinically diagnosed with Marfan syndrome. The only geneticist she could find was a pediatric Marfan geneticist. She told my daughter that she told my daughter that since the aortic root in a person with Marfan's has usually enlarged by age, eight, by age 18, my daughter probably has some type of connective tissue, but she doesn't have Marfan syndrome. Is this true? Um, so could you specify for me whether your daughter does or does not have aortic dilation? Yeah, I'll wait until she gets back to that. Sorry. It's okay. So before we have the answer, um, there is a kind of a common misconception that if you don't have aortic dilation, that you don't have Marfan syndrome, but that's actually not true. So as we're starting to genetically test more and more people, we're finding that I think it's somewhere around 20% of patients with Marfan syndrome actually don't have aortic dilation. And, and one thing that's really interesting about Marfan Foundation is it... Um, it exhibits a phenomenon that we call in ge genetics um, variable expressivity. And what that means is that um, people in the same family with the same muta mutation can actually have completely different features of Marfan syndrome. So we could have some relatives that are very tall, have long fingers, have aortic root dilation, and then other family members that are actually short. I just saw a woman or a grandmother with Marfan syndrome a couple of weeks ago who was only 5'4", and the rest of her family was all above six feet tall, but everyone carried the same gene mutation. So Marfan syndrome is interesting in that even though you have the same genetic mutation as other people in your family, you guys could all have different features that are associated with Marfan syndrome. And um, the answer was she does not have a dilation. I would say, um, I, w I think that she should be evaluated. I think that you first, if you have Marfan syndrome, that you should have genetic testing. And that way we could identify um, the exact genetic change in you. And then at that point, it would be fair to test all of your children um, for the, the same genetic change because all of them would have a 50% chance to also have Marfan syndrome. Okay, um, the next question is, what do you think of the genetic counseling kits sold in drugstores like CVS? <laughs> Great question. Um, I, so I think the genetic counseling community in general doesn't love the direct to consumer genetic testing kits, primarily for the reason um, that it's really hard to interpret genetic testing results um, on your own. And I, and I also don't know that any of those genetic testing kits would offer clinical genetic testing for Marfan syndrome. I know they order, uh, they can offer genetic testing for some of the cancer related genes. But um, like the BRCA gene, if you've ever heard of that being associated with breast cancer, and, and even with uh, the, the breast cancer related genes, the genetic testing for that is um, a pretty small scope. So they don't actually read the whole gene. They um, just test for very specific mutations and, uh, and patients think, oh, if I've tested negative for that, I'm definitely not at risk for getting this, but that's actually not true. So I think the moral of the story is that anything that's direct to consumer, at least at this point, um, really isn't ideal for clinical genetic testing purposes. It is best to see a genetic counselor or a geneticist, somebody that's well-versed in genetics in order to have appropriate genetic testing. Um, we had just a comment. Thank you for everything you do. This was wonderful. My daughter has Marfan syndrome and I actually work for Illuminia. Illuminia. Oh, cool. So please let me know if you ever need anything from us. Happy to help. That's so awesome. Thank you. Um, is there anybody else who's on have any other questions?
Um, the woman whose with daughter we were talking about mm-hmm. said she's 64 and had not been diagnosed with Marfan. Oh, she has just not. Yeah, just her daughter. Oh, her daughter had a clinical diet. I'm sorry. I yes, that's okay. the question. Um, I would I would still recommend if if you think your daughter has several features associated with Marfan syndrome that she be evaluated by um, either a genetic counselor or a geneticist just to make sure that um, genetic testing is or is not appropriate for her. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions um, tonight? Okay, um, I want to thank Taylor again for her incredibly wonderful presentation and to thank all of you for taking your time and hope that this presentation was helpful to you. The webinar will be on our website in a few days if you want to review it or definitely suggest it to a friend to see it. Um, in the spring, um, in May, we have one more empowerment webinar for this year. Uh, it's called Tips of Coping with Depression, Anxiety, and Anger with Dr. Melissa Flint, who's a psychologist, and that'll be on Wednesday, May 22nd at 8 o'clock. Please go to our website to register for this new program. And I also want to encourage everyone to go to our website to register and look at the information about our annual conference, which will be in Houston, Texas, um, and hosted by Texas Children. Thank you, Taylor. Mm -hmm. Um, The registration is open and available. And if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, Let me see if I got another question. Oh, no, just saying thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. And I hope um, that you have a wonderful evening and a great weekend. Thank Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.